Think back to the early stages of your business career. Did you have a clear idea of where you were headed? For most of us, it's not that easy. Change is okay and uncertainty is okay, but whatever it is, just do something. I just knew I just needed to keep doing something until I, until I found a place that I was okay with. Today's guest is Mai Hun Harrington. And in this interview, she'll share with us what to do when you don't know what to do and how she found her way to continue the legacy of a proud family business. Welcome to Crummer Connections podcast series. I'm your host, J.B. Adams. In this series, I'm talking with members of the Crummer community and inviting them to share their accomplishments, challenges, and best career and business advice. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Consistently ranked as the number one MBA in the state of Florida, the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to prepare you to become a global, innovative, responsible business leader. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. This season of Crummer Connections is focused on examining service as we meet with Rollins and Crummer alumni who are serving the Crummer community as well as the community at large. Today's guest is Mai Hun Harrington, Director of Administration at Kobe Japanese Steakhouse and immediate past president on the Rollins College Alumni Board of Directors. She has a culinary background, particularly in restaurant management, and she graduated from Rollins in 2010 with a degree in psychology and again in 2015 with her MBA. This segment is called Services Personal, and it lets us understand our guests' personal motivations for leading and serving. My Hun Harrington, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. All right, Maihan, you currently serve as immediate past president of the Rollins College Alumni Board of Directors. And I would like to start by asking you about your philosophy of service. Why is service a big deal? What's your philosophy when it comes to serving others and serving the community? So I believe um, service has a lot to do with creating meaningful relationships and ultimately a meaningful life. Um, I think everybody has the capacity to give, whether that's their time, their effort, their resources. And when you make that conscious choice to give that to a organization, an individual, a cause that you feel strongly towards, it really opens up that opportunity to make those meaningful connections with not only the other person on the receiving end, but those that are serving beside you. And that's, that's always a good thing. I think, um, Life's about meaningful relationships and finding ways to serve and finding more ways that, uh, in which you can serve is always a good thing. Did you always have this philosophy or did you arrive upon it later in your life or career? You know, I, I would have to say I always loved, I lo I'm, a, I'm a social person, so I always wanted to find ways to meet new people. I always wanted to get involved with organizations understand ways in which I can do more things, you know, whether that was in sports, whether that was in my community, organizations at school. So I always had that desire to uh, connect. So are you saying that service is a social thing for you? It, it is partly social in that early on in my life, um, it was, hey, you know, on the weekends, my friends, we, we would get together and serve at Habitat. Um, of humanity or finding different ways to um, get together with other people. And then from there, you, you connect with other people um, that, at the organization and your circle just uh, becomes bigger. And I, I just love that dynamic. I love that ability to get together with people and uh, make a positive impact with whatever it is that you're doing. If there are skeptics out there, and I don't know if there are, but there are some who are questioning the motivation for service. Sure. So I want you, like, sell it to us. Build a case for us. I would say, sure, there's a lot that you can gain from it. Uh, but I, I think nowadays, especially in our world right now, it's, it's a lot of what, what's in it for me, um, what can I do for myself, and it's a lot of taking. Yeah. Um, and I think when you think the reverse, think a little bit more selfless. What can you do for others? What can you give? What, what do you have? And it doesn't have to be much. It doesn't have to be money all the time. It doesn't, but your time, your resources, your friendship, your anything. 
it just makes for a better, better relationship with people. You're just, you're just promoting good. And I think having a balance of understanding what you have and giving back is a good way to uh, kind of, um, yeah, be grateful for what you have. All right. Excellent. You gave us many reasons for getting involved in providing service. Does, does getting involved in service make you a better business person? Absolutely. We have this saying at Koe, um, we're not in the restaurant business, we're in the people business. And a uh, big part of that is, of course, we're in the hospitality business. But every day, you know, what we do at work, you're interacting with employees, you know, you're, you're trying to create a positive work environment, a productive career for them. You're obviously working with your customers, because that is who you ultimately serve. And then also everybody else in between. So that is your colleagues at work. That is your other business partners, vendors that you work with. We work with so many different people. And that's day to day. You know, work takes up so much of your time. So when you serve, when I think about service outside of work, you know, you expand your circle, you, you see other perspectives, but also you practice kind of that service muscle. And service is at every level and with every person. And that's really the root of it. I, I think service, it really comes down to those relationships. And as the more I learn to serve others in different capacities, the better business person I am. And I would say that that is what makes it truly a family business. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to come back to that in a moment. My hun, this segment is uh, about your backstory and it gives us a chance to get to know you and understand your early business influences. So we're going to start with just some short answers. Um, tell us where you were born and raised. Born in Altamont Springs, Florida. So you are all local. All local. Very much. Okay. Is there a generation that you identify with? I'm a millennial. Oh. <laughs> okay. And what were your parents' occupations? So my father studied uh, when he was in college. He was a computer science and a accountant. And my mom was an electrical engineer. But of course, they, they left that to eventually start our family business with my grandfather, Kobe Japanese Steakhouse. Okay, so let's dig back even a little bit deeper. And I know that this is not necessarily your story to tell, but I find family businesses fascinating. So the story of the Kobe Japanese Steakhouse starts, does it start before you were born? Yes, it starts way before I was born. Well, actually, no, I wouldn't say way before I was born. <laughs> not that old. Uh, or I'm not that young. <laughs> but uh, so my grandfather started it. I mean, I don't know how far we want to go back. But uh, when my parents immigrated here in the 1969, right before the fall of Saigon, and their parents had them go through education. So my mom, they're like, become an engineer. She became an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. Um my dad studied, uh, like I said, computer science and, um, and became a CPA and worked for a big telecommunication company at the time. So at the time, my grandfather, um, Kobe Japanese had the first one, actually, I don't think most people know, actually started in Montreal, Canada, hmm. early 1980s. So probably 1982, I think, is when they started uh, the very first one. It was a small, little teppanyaki place connect it was actually a, a restaurant inside a motel ah. at the time and it was uh, very small uh very quaint but when he first came here they they my grandmother and my grandfather purchased this motel in the restaurant and a little backstory about my grandfather he he's again entrepreneur in vietnam had many businesses he was in banking he had hotels he um was in a textile business. So he had a lot of different businesses. So coming to Montreal, he continued to pursue on um, different types of businesses and landed on a motel and a, a restaurant. But he was, sick of, he was sick of the winters and decided after a trip to Orlando that he was going to move to Orlando and take along Kobe with him. He wanted to open up our first Kobe Japanese steakhouse here in Orlando. And so um, my dad kind of being sick of the whole corporate job, um, pursued his, his aspirations to get away from that and, and have his own business, went with my grandfather 
to um, Orlando to open up the first Kobe Japanese steakhouse here in the U.S. in Altamont Springs in the office that I'm in right now um, in 1984. All right. So I just have to ask because this is what everyone is thinking. So I'm just going to give voice to it. Uh, <laughs> Vietnamese heritage, Japanese steakhouse. Mm -hmm. How did this decision come about? Yeah. So if I could describe my my grandfather, he big personality. You know, he, I mean, entrepreneur, always looking for the next thing to do. Big laugh, love to have a good time. And um, so when he was thinking about a business, you know, um, he wasn't going to go with something like, um, like to some regular restaurant. He was exploring different restaurant ideas as he, as he usually does with any business venture. And uh, he, yeah, at the time there was a Benihana's, which was mm -hmm. pretty established at the time. And then there was also the, some little chains here in Orlando. There was uh, one called Arigato's. And when he visited, he basically went to one of these restaurants and said, this is awesome. This is what I want to do. And what people also don't know is that Kobe wasn't the only restaurant that they started. Uh, they, they also had a Polynesian restaurant, which was a really big thing back in the eighties, um, with a full Polynesian show. It was a dinner, I, I guess you would call a dinner show. So there was a lot of different concepts that they did. Um, unfortunately my Tiki, that Polynesian restaurant's not here, not no longer with us, but Kobe is. So that's what just kind of stuck and, and what they went with in terms of expanding, expanding, uh, the business. All right. Uh, tell us how many Kobe steakhouses there are right now. They're all in Central Florida. Yes. So there are 12 locations total. Um, there's a seven in the Orlando uh, market and then five in what we call the West Coast Tampa area. All right. As you look at your grandfather and your father as entrepreneurs, what are some of the lessons that you got from observing them? I would say... I don't know whether it's the entrepreneur spirit or it's the the drive of them being immigrants here in the U.S. You know, having left a war-ridden country behind them, everything that they ever owned, everything that they ever knew or had behind them, they really ultimately came to the U.S. to pursue the American dream. And there's something about that spark, that drive that they had that... You really, when you witness it, it's, it really is amazing. You know, um, the desire to really create a life, a, a better life here in, in the U.S. And so, I don't know, I would say the lessons that I've learned is, is really don't take for granted for the opportunities that we have here in the U.S. and right now. And especially being a first generation here in the U.S., that's all I ever really know. I, I visited other places in the world, but don't don't take for granted what we have here and the opportunities and your ability to work hard and pursue what you want. Just curious, because you're the third generation of this family, do you identify as an entrepreneur? I don't actually. Yeah, and it's okay. Yeah. And uh, I think that's okay. Um, uh, I, I think a lot of people ask me that, um, whether I have the entrepreneurial spirit. And I think if I had my dad or my grandfather's entrepreneurial spirit, I wouldn't be here. I think I would have taken and done 10 different things <laughs> by now. All right. Our guest is my hun Harrington. And when we come back, we'll learn about some turning points and takeaways in her own career. Please stay with us. As a member of the Crummer community, you know that it's the people you meet at Crummer who make the greatest difference in your career. So I want to tell you about Rollins Connect. It's a networking platform that will help you stay connected to over 40,000 Rollins alumni worldwide. And it's available right now. Please go to rollinsconnect.rollins.edu, check it out, and if you need someone to connect to, connect to me, JB Adams. That's Rollins Connect, your connection to the Crummer community. Welcome back to Crummer Connections. I'm JB Adams, and our guest is Maihun Harrington, Director of Administration at Kobe Japanese Steakhouse and immediate past president of the Rollins College Alumni Board of Directors. Before the break, we were chatting about early business influences. Now we would like to hear more about Maihun's professional journey. So 
family business. You're kind of growing up in it. You're exposed to a very entrepreneurial spirit. Um, what were your early career aspirations? You know, it was, um, I wasn't sure. Uh, and when I first grad, well, at Rollins, I was a psychology major. Okay. But when it came down to, you know, senior year, I was in the honors program. I did an honors thesis and I, I knew I didn't want to pursue psychology like, you know, any further in terms of like master's or PhD. Um, and then at the time, you know, my parents were being the typical <laughs> Asian parent was like, why don't you become a lawyer or, uh, you know, I don't know, or, uh, pers- yeah, that's probably what they were. That's really what they were pushing at the time. But I was all over the place. And when I really took a step back, my dad, um, it was more my mom pushing the lawyer thing, but my dad was like, you know what, I, why don't you take some time off and really think about what, what, what you want to do, pursue something that you're just interested in. Um, and I, I'm so grateful that he allowed me to have that time. So I packed up my stuff and, and headed off to New York city. And, uh, so when I, when I graduated, um, yeah, I, I, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Law school was still kind of in the back of my mind. Maybe eventually I'll come to terms with that's what I just have to do. But I went to New York. I enrolled in a culinary program just because I I was interested. I loved the idea. I was exploring options. And I, I did that for a little bit, which led me to different opportunities. I was um, at the time working at a French bakery waking up early in the morning. I love that. Baking croissants in the morning. And then eventually I got an internship at the Food Network. I did that for a little bit. So I jumped around during my year in New York. And then finally I decided I needed to get a real job. And I I interviewed at um, Hillstone, which had a management program, which I uh, was was accepted in and um, did that for a little bit. I was in New York, I was in LA and Miami as a manager for Hillstone. And I was just going to say for the sake of our listeners, yeah, many of us are familiar with Hillstone here in uh-huh. Winter Park. Um, you didn't work at the Winter Park Hillstone. You worked at the Beverly Hills Hillstone. I did. I worked at the one. It's, um, it's actually one of their other concepts called uh, South Beverly Grill. Mm-hmm. It was a great experience and it really made me think. I, I was like, I think, um, I think. I like the restaurant hospitality industry, but more so on the restaurant management side. So that's what kind of led me back to Orlando. You know, my, my family has a restaurant and I came back with some knowledge and some expertise in that and started just doing some marketing for them, helping out the restaurants. And I've been there since. And when would you say is the moment that you realized you were leveraging your family business experience? I mean, I would say from the very beginning, when I first applied to, I knew that, you know, if I, let me try this out. Um, I think my dad always, he, they, they never pressured me to join the family business right away. That was never any, you know, they said, we want you to find what you want to do. And if you want to join the family business, it's here. And so when I was jumping around doing different things, um, when Hill, the Hillstone opportunity came up. I did think like, you know, if this works out, um, if this is something that I can see myself doing the business side of restaurant business, um, I'll probably, you know, head back home. So I knew from the, from the beginning. Okay. But again, curiosity out of that progression, move to New York, get in the culinary program, work at the bakery, the food network, and then eventually Hillstone. That's when you Mm -hmm. left New York. Yep. But over the course of all of that, when was the moment that you said, oh, this is where I belong? You know, that entire time when I was moving around, I don't think there was ever a moment that I felt like I belonged. I think I was um, constantly feeling like I should belong, right? Mm-hmm. Like I needed to find something that I was passionate about, that I wanted to continue just it was just the answer you're you're seeking an answer mm-hmm. that like i i graduated already i've been doing all these things where do i start or where where do i belong you know kind of your question 
And it wasn't until much later in, in my career. I think really when I came back and I decided to pursue my Crummer degree, because at that point I was like, hey, I think this is what I want to do. And I think Crummer is going to help me become better at it. So that period of, you know, uncertainty, jumping around different jobs, I think it's okay looking back now. I think at the time, it's not always a great feeling because you might look at other colleagues and think, oh, they they figured it out, yes. but they probably didn't. And it's okay. And you're going to find that in different parts of your life, you're going to feel that way too. And then, and it's okay. Change is okay. And uncertainty is okay. But whatever it is, just do something. Um, keep learning. Um, you know, I just knew I just needed to keep doing something until I, until I found a place that I was okay with. I love it. And I also love it when you share the takeaway without me having asked for it. Um, that's perfect. Uh, oh, wait, one more question for you. When was the moment where you felt this is where I belong? So I would say I mean, it's more recent than, than I'd like to admit, to tell you the truth. Um, and I think at some point in my life, when I'm 34, I have two kids. And prior to having kids, prior to being married, I think you're always seeking, where do I belong? What should I be doing? But there was a change in me when I, I think when I started having kids, to be honest, where I felt like there was a change of responsibility. My dad's getting older. Um, and although I know he's that type that he'll never, quote unquote, retire, he'll work forever because he loves it. I think there was a chain to me where it was like, I, I was constantly needing their support or they're always helping me, parenting me. It got, I got to a point where I was like, there's this responsibility that I have now. I'm at the family business. I need to take on more. My dad needs to slow down. Um, this is where I belong. This is my purpose. This is what I need to do. And at that point, you know, I've been with, I've been with the company for years now. I've made the connections with so many employees and, you know, Kobe has become a part of me and it is part of me. It always has been, but um, understanding that my purpose here is, is for my family. It's for my dad. It's for the next generation um, and whatever, whatever that is for Kobe. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, all right, we're going to transition to segment four, which is called best business advice. So my hon Harrington, what's your best business advice for today's professionals? I would say expect change in every aspect of your life and business. And right when you think you have it, have it down, it's going to change again. So just embrace it and carry on with what you do best. Great advice for any business professionals out there. My Hun Harrington, we're about to wrap up our time together. Is there anything else, any other message that you would like to share with the Cromer community? If you meet anyone that knows me, they know that I absolutely love Rollins. You know, I went here for undergrad, pursued my Cromer degree here. I continue to serve Rollins in so many different ways afterwards. Um, I mean, right after college, I was uh, reaching back out to see how I could reconnect back to Rollins and I am so grateful for everything that it's given me. And that's the reason why I continue to, to give back however I can. My Hun Harrington, thank you so much for joining us on Crummer Connections and sharing your story. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Now is a great time to consider enhancing your career success by pursuing an advanced degree in business. And the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to help you become a global, innovative, responsible business leader. To learn more about the programs and begin the application process, go to crummer.rollins.edu. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon with another episode. Crummer Connections podcast series is a production of Victor Media Group. If you like this show, follow us on your favorite social media platform. Today's show was created and hosted by J.B. Adams and executive produced by Gerard Mitchell. Our showrunner is Kyle Sawyer with production assistance by Rachel O'Brien and audio design by Aaron Trinka. Our gratitude goes out to Mike Brown and Loveland Finley in Alumni Relations for their gracious help and support. 
Until next time, Fiat Lux.